Thanks, Craig. Um, we are here to worship today. Welcome this morning to the First Presbyterian Church of San Luis Obispo. A welcome to those of you who are here live and a special welcome to those of you who will be watching later uh, and to any visitors that we might have. We're going to get uh, we're going to get used to saying that again as we prepare uh, for reopening. It's it's an amazing day. So I woke up to Wimbledon. Uh, I woke up to watching a guy uh, launch his own uh, spacecraft into space for a few minutes. Um, later on, there's a little bit of, uh, I, I, I hear there's a soccer match going on uh, later on today. And uh, I just want to tell you that, uh, you know, I talk a lot about my Italian heritage and I, uh, and I talk a lot sometimes about my Scottish heritage because it ties with my own Presbyterian roots. But um, but I lived in London for nine years and uh, I am, I'm an England fan and that, that has caused me some problems lately. Uh, but what I wanna share with you is what the front of my house looks like right now. That is a, uh, that's an Italian flag in the front, obviously. That's an English flag right behind there. And uh, uh, when, you're, when you're conflicted between one thing and another, sometimes you do both. That's, that's been my choice today. Uh, but it is, uh, it is one of these times where so many amazing things are happening. Uh, sports events, you know, if, if you're not a sports fan, sports events have this capacity to draw us together. And so um, I'm, I'm claiming a little bit of that drawing together for us as we gather in, uh, in God's name uh, to worship together. Let's join in the unison prayer that we are uh, using as our invitation to worship. Let's read this prayer together. God of the covenant, in our baptism, you called us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us courage like you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We come to that God with uh, our own brokenness in our, in our hands, and this, this next song talks about that brokenness and also ties with our first reading later on in the service. Uh, let's sing together in worship, Broken Vessels. these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken Sweet the song. 
to our worship team. Uh, it's because we uh, can claim those promises that God uh, raises the broken to life that we can come to him in confession. And so I'm going to hand it to Jen as she leads us in the, the prayer of confession and the assurance of pardon. Good morning. Now is the time that we corporately confess our sins together and then take some time to silently confess our personal sins. Please pray with me. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness, in your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Now take some time for silent confession. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in the power for us. Christ prays for us. Amen. Thanks, Jen. Just a few announcements about the life of the church. Uh, we are continuing our process of preparing for reopening. Uh, committees will meet this week and, uh, and give an update and, and hear updates from uh, other, uh, uh, other chairs, as we have reported last week. And so uh, lots of things going on, lots of tests. Some of you were on uh, the test we did last Thursday, and we are, um, you know, July 25th is coming. Uh, July 25th, 10 o'clock, we are open here. Uh, you'll see some communication about that as we go, but um, here's where we are right now. What, what we are uh, looking to do is we're going to reopen uh, for people who are, have, are vaccinated. We're not checking badges at the door. We're trusting that folks who come are, come, uh, are, are people who are vaccinated already. Uh, we will be wearing masks indoors, and we will not be singing, not yet. So uh, keep those things in mind as you prepare for uh, coming back here. We will also be streaming the service live on YouTube and we'll send out very clear instructions about that. And uh, you'll also be able to watch the service later recorded uh, if that works out best for you. So three ways to participate once we reopen. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you one way or the other uh, as we uh, continue in the life of this church. Our creeds class continues this Wednesday night. Uh, I'm uh, going to do a little bit more on the Barman Declaration, which we talked about last week. If you, uh, if that's a curious thing to you, come join us at seven. I'll do a little review. Uh, but the phrase that we remember from last week and that we're going to explore a little bit uh, as we come into this Wednesday evening is: We reject the false doctrine that says something. 
And so we're going to talk about what it means for, uh, for us to be able to say that along with the confessing church uh, back in 1930s Germany. And then I'm just going to invite you to pray for uh, Vacation Bible School, which begins tomorrow. Uh, we got 12 kids. Uh, Jen's all set for that, and uh, lots of folks are participating. But we've got 12 precious kids coming uh, into our uh, into our fold here to uh, to be loved and to have a great time and to learn about Jesus. So uh, keep us in your prayers this week as we serve some children uh, here in the community. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Jen for the the scripture reading and the creed. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Listen for the word of the Lord. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus's sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The word of the Lord. Now, please join me as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thanks, Jen. Uh, as we come and worship, we also bring our lives to God in prayer. And so I'm going to invite you to pray with me for just a bit. I'm going to leave some silent spaces in there and introduce maybe something you can pray silently for uh, wherever you are. Uh, but this is, a, this is our chance at a communal prayer, and, uh, and I want to, to be able to give you space uh, to, to commune with God in that special way, too. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, all the gifts that you have given us. We, we come to you as worshiping people because of your majesty and greatness, but also because of your tender mercy and your grace to us. God, we are grateful people as we come to you in worship. We're grateful people as we come to you with our own petitions and concerns. Uh, God, hear the gratefulness in our heart, even as we ask for things during this time of prayer. God, our world continues to be in uh, disarray. Uh, our, it, it continues to be uh, to lack peace and to lack safety and as we, uh, as we continue now in the 16th month of this pandemic season, uh, we ask now for your blessing, for your strength, for your continued protection. Uh, God, in the silence that I leave here, each person can offer their own prayer uh, for this world. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord. And for this nation, Lord, for one week after we celebrated our independence, we continue to be divided by political anger, uh, by racial tension, uh, by uh, confusion and biases and hatreds against people who are not like us. 
God, we ask for your healing there. And we ask that you hear our own prayers for unity and healing for this nation. Lord, hear our prayers. And God, for our state and county and for this community, we pray that you would continue to uh, help us reopen safely, that you would continue to give people caution, uh, but also give people a sense of the joy of reconnection. God, we pray for our local community now, and we ask that you hear our prayers. And for this church, oh God, we pray. Uh, we ask for your blessings that we would be uh, united together as we prepare to reopen, that you would give us a renewed sense of your mission, uh, that you would bring us together to serve you and to serve each other and to serve our community in Christ's name. Lord, hear our prayers for this church. And finally, God, for the people we know who are grieving, for the people we know who are ill or suffering or in pain, for the people we know who are lonely, God, we ask for your hand to be on each of those people, to bring healing, to bring comfort, to bring peace, and to bring connection. God, hear our prayers for the individuals in our own communities and lives who we care about. Gracious God, it's because of your own son's invitation to pray that we bring our lives before you in prayer. And so now we join together in the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's take some time and uh, hear what Jen has to say for the kids today. Hi. So today we are going to be talking about Jeremiah, not the bullfrog, but the prophet. What does a prophet do anyway? What is the most important task of a prophet? Usually to bring God's people back to God, because sometimes God's people wander away from God. They might worship other gods or do bad things. So God sends a prophet like Jeremiah to relight a fire in them and their devotion to God. These beads represent the people who are on fire for God. They're so excited and jumping around and they're really noisy. But what happens when they lose their fire and they stop moving and living for God? They become really quiet and they don't have very much excitement in their life and they might start worshiping other gods or doing bad things. So what does God do? That's right, God sends a prophet. Sometimes the people ignore the prophet God sends. That is what happened to Jeremiah a lot. But when the people listen to the prophet like Jeremiah that God sent, they were on fire again and moving and sharing God's love. I'm not sure there are any modern day prophets, but 
I am sure that we can be movers and shakers for God and jump around and be excited and share his love. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for putting a fire in us and for enabling us to love you and then love people and share that with the world. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jen. That's a great pan, by the way. That's a that's a perfect sort of pasta finishing pan there. But <clears throat> and now I've gone and made myself hungry right when I need to start talking. Um, good morning, everybody. We are uh, we are well and truly into summer now, and uh, I want to introduce a, uh, a a summer series that will be in uh, right through to um, to September. Uh, we're going to be talking about people in the Bible who, um, who teach us something about the life of faith. And a lot of these characters are people that we don't often talk about. Like today, we're going to be talking about Jeremiah. Um, we may quote a few things, and you probably all know a couple of greeting card verses out of Jeremiah, but, uh, but Jeremiah is one of those characters in the Bible that has a, a, a rich life story and who teaches us something about what it means to be a disciple. Um, so Jeremiah is what we call a major prophet, uh, along with uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. And it's funny because for all the things that get complicated in uh, biblical studies, uh, this one is fairly simple. The major prophets are called the major prophets because they wrote more, uh, not because they're better or more important. Uh, I think we saw that in our Bible study last season when we were looking at Amos, who's one of the minor prophets, but has an amazing amount to say uh, to us in our own contemporary lives. Jeremiah wrote the book that bears his name, uh, but he also wrote a book called Lamentations and probably had a hand in writing First and Second Kings too. And it's that Lamentations book that uh, earns Jeremiah the title, The Complainer in Chief. That's what I'm calling him today. I want to give a little background on Jeremiah, and we're, we're going to do this each week. We'll talk about what we know about the life of the person we're talking about each Sunday, and then we'll try and draw from that life what we can learn about what it means to be followers of Jesus in our own time. And so today, uh, just a little background on Jeremiah. Uh, he, he's linked a little bit with a king that shows up. Actually, it's a king I'm going to talk about next week, but King Josiah is a king that inherited the throne uh, at a time when the people of God had strayed far from, uh, from their faith in Jehovah. And he, he discovers, it's like going into the attic and discovering an old book or an artifact or something. He goes up there and uh, he, they rediscover the Torah, which apparently had not been read for a generation in that land. And they, they discover it and they read it for the people and the people are convicted. And uh, Josiah leads the people of God back into being the people of the covenant with God. The nation that Josiah and Jeremiah steps into, uh, that nation had deviated so far from God that they had completely broken their covenants with God, causing God to withdraw his blessings. This is part of the economy of the Old Testament. God has these covenant relationships with his people, and uh, he promises to give them what they need and to bless them with protection as long as they're faithful to him. People of Israel had gone so far as to build high and mighty altars to a, an idol called Baal, and even to prepare to offer human sacrifices uh, to, to Baal. That's a, that's a difficult thing for us to even imagine that God's people might do, but, uh, but they were doing it then. And so uh, Jeremiah steps in. He becomes the prophet to this nation that had deviated so far from God that they had completely broken the covenant with him. Jeremiah was called and guided by God to deliver the bad news that the nation of Israel would be plundered, that it would be faced with famine, and that it would be taken captive by foreigners who would exile them to a foreign land. And so uh, all of that is, is really to, meant to say that God gave Jeremiah the worst calling that a prophet can get. 
to go to a group of people and to name their sin and to warn those people of God's punishment. That's a tough thing. That's the calling that Jeremiah got. So who was Jeremiah? Jeremiah is one of those uh, prophets in the, in the Old Testament who came from a family of prophets. His father was Hilkiah, who was also a priest uh, in, uh, in that tradition. And even though he apparently had a joyful early life, uh, the difficulties that we see in the books of Jeremiah and Lam Lamentations have prompted scholars to refer to Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. When Jeremiah shows up in art or when there are statues made of him or tapestries or any of the ways that uh, people used visual arts to tell Bible stories in the past, Jeremiah always has his head down and he's always weeping or crying or looking miserable somehow. All of this happens in the 7th century B.C., uh, Jeremiah was called to his prophetic ministry right around uh, 626 BC. And we know that because of in the first few verses of his book, he names the king that was in power uh, when he came into his ministry. Jeremiah was called by God to give a prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction that would occur from invaders from the north. And this was because Israel had been unfaithful to the laws of the covenant, like I said, and had forsaken God by worshiping the Baals, B-A-A-L. Uh, that's uh, one of the, uh, the constant villains in the Old Testament. It was an alternate God that people offered sacrifices to when they had strayed from the God of the covenant. For our text, and there's more than one text today, we're going to look at some texts that talk about uh, Jeremiah's ministry. Uh, but I want to read the first one. This is the uh, Jeremiah 1, verses 1 through 9. This talks about Jeremiah's call to prophetic ministry. Listen for God's word this morning. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Ju Judah. See, that's how we know it's 626 BC. All of those kings are attested in history uh, in particular years. Here's how the call goes. The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, Jeremiah said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. This is the way Jeremiah is called to ministry. God comes to him uh, and says, I'm going to send you with this message. Jeremiah comes back and says, I can't do this. I'm too young. And God says to him, I can do anything through you. And in, in this touching scene, reaches out and, and touches Jeremiah's mouth and says, I have put my words in your mouth. But it's not a happy ministry. And Jeremiah uh, is called because there's a particular problem, this, this problem of the abandonment of the covenant and, uh, and the turning to other idols and gods. And so in chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Jeremiah identifies the problem going on in Israel. He says this. These are actually God's words. This is what the, the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land, 
to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. And your priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, offering and following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Jeremiah comes into a place that had completely abandoned God, that, or that had transferred the kind of allegiance they were supposed to have to God to something else, to another idol God. And so he, but listen to the questions God asks. To the people, he says, don't you remember me? I'm the one who saved you. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt and put you in a land where you had plenty to eat and, and safety. And then he reserves a special uh, criticism for the priests, for the people who were the go-between, between between God and people. He said, when the going got tough, you didn't say, where's God? You turned to other gods. You don't even know the covenant that I established with you. And so there's a serious problem here that Jeremiah is coming to address. And so Jeremiah's message can be found in the seventh chapter, in the first seven verses. Listen for what Jeremiah said to his people. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this space, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. So this is the problem, and this is the message that Jeremiah comes to deliver to the problem. He tells them that there is a chance for you to be rescued from the coming punishment. If you worship me faithfully, if you are just in the ways that you treat each other, if you don't oppress foreigners, if you uh, deal with each other fairly, uh, fairly and demonstrate love and justice to each other, notice Notice that it's partly about loving God and a lot about loving each other. A lot about loving the people that God has placed in your midst. These folks could demonstrate their faithfulness to God if they treat each other justly, if they don't oppress foreigners, if they're good to widows and to orphans. That should be a message to us too, but we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Because ultimately, uh, Israel doesn't hear, uh, doesn't heed Jeremiah's warning. And so uh, they, they will be taken into exile. But even as they receive their punishment, Jeremiah delivers a promise from God. And we find that in chapter 33, verses 10 and 11. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. God is 
God sends Jeremiah to tell the people what they've done, and he tells them what he's going to do about them, uh, do about it, and he, he even gives them an out right at the end that they can turn from this punishment. And yet, even after the punishment is given, God promises to restore them. Even after their suffering, uh, their season of suffering is over, God pr promises to restore them to happiness, to gladness, to their land, to uh, the voices of bride and bridegroom and all the joyful things about being in community and that they will be thankful people again. Jeremiah is an important prophet for us as Christians. It's not just a, an Old Testament prophet talking about Old Testament things that don't have relevance for us. His critique of Israel uh, even of those who still claimed to follow God, was that they were just going through the motions, showing up for public worship, but never really meeting God there. One writer said that Jeremiah challenged the, the quote, the, the spiritualized religion and insisted upon the primacy of the individual's relationship with God. In other words, Jeremiah called Israel out for going through the motions instead of really meaning what they said and sang in worship. That was the key for Jeremiah more than 2,500 years ago, that, they were, that we were not meant to go through the motions of religion, but that we were meant to have a personal and dynamic relationship with the, relig uh, with the living God. You can imagine how this went over for Jeremiah, right? Uh, how his criticisms and promise of exile and punishment, you can imagine how that went over with the people. For his ministry, Jeremiah suffered these things. He was attacked by his own brothers because he was bad for the family business. He was beaten and put into stocks by another priest of God. He was imprisoned by the king he was threatened with death more than once. At one point, he was thrown into what the Bible softly calls a cistern, which is a nice word for a sewer. And Jeremiah preached even from the sewer, the word of God. He was accused of being a false prophet, prophet but still, when Nebuchadnezzar seized Jerusalem in 586, the foreign king ordered that Jeremiah was freed from prison and treated well. So what does Jeremiah teach us about the life of faith in Christ? That world seemed, I mean, the life of the first century, the, the, the life of the times of Jesus and the disciples, that seems far enough from us. But 600 years or 700 years before that, what does Jeremiah teach us? about the life of faith in Christ. The first thing he teaches us is that the call to be faithful to God's covenant with us and to live in relationship with him is the most important thing. That covenant is completed and fulfilled in Jesus, and it's in the story of Jesus that we are called to live and to share. The second thing is that even if all that's true, sometimes our message is unpopular, even among the faithful. Throughout its history, the church has needed correction and reformation from the inside out. Every single generation has to decide and discern how to do that in their own time. But listen to this other verse from Jeremiah. In, in, in chapter 29, and this may be the most familiar verse for most of us in Jeremiah, this is what God says to him. Even as he's suffering and even as his people are about to be taken into exile in a foreign country, God says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. No matter what else is going on, no matter what else happens in our church, no matter what else happens in this nation or in this world, we are called to seek the welfare of our own community and our own nation, even when it feels like we're in exile. We seek 
the health and the well-being of the people around us, even when it costs us something. That means when we're given the choice between allegiance to our own nation or our own political or social views on the one hand and doing something that holds up our end of the covenant and helping someone in need, we choose to help. That's God's call on our lives. And finally, maybe one of the things we learn from Jeremiah is from his example, Jeremiah didn't like being a prophet very much. And maybe there's a lesson in there for us too. It's this life of faith, and if this life of faith and discipleship is too easy, maybe we're doing it wrong. That's where the reading from Corinthians that Jen shared with us earlier, that's where those words come, uh, come into play for us as we think about what Jeremiah means for us 2,500 years later. Remember Paul's words, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Some variation of those things might happen to us too, but it's our call to remember and to remind each other to remember that we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might also be revealed in our bodies. In this coming season of seeing each other again and worshiping and serving together again, it's on us to reflect on what kind of people we want to be. My prayer for all of us is that we can hear God's call, that we can answer it faithfully, and that we can lean on each other when times get hard. May that be true for all of us today and every day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the ways that you call us to service. We thank you even for the ways that might cause us pain and anguish. Because we know your Holy Spirit never leaves us. May we be bearers of your son, Jesus Christ, in his death, so that we might be bearers of the gift of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his life. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Let's respond to the hearing of God's word read and proclaimed uh, by sharing together in our tithes and morning offerings. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, an ocean steep, my faith will stay.
It's our turn now. We get to sing. Uh, let's sing a hymn of praise and commitment. All hail the power of Jesus' name. that bit about we'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. That's the privilege that we get to uh, engage in as the people of God in the body of Christ. We also get to engage in a little fellowship. So I'm going to invite you, uh, you're going to see an invitation on the screen to join a group. And I'll encourage you for the next five or six minutes or so to, uh, to greet the people in your group and maybe give a little update on what's going on with you uh, and uh, hopefully meet someone you don't know very well. Hi, everybody. Hope Hi. you had a nice little chat in there. I, I learned a lot about people's summer plans and, uh, and uh, this will make sense to the other five people in my group. Now I really want to go fishing. Uh, <laughs> folks have gone fishing. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's join together as we, uh, as we close today in our declaration of mission. Friends, ooh, <laughs> there it is. Friends, what is our mission? Our mission is to glorify <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> and to be and to in the of God's healing, reconciling, life-giving <laughs> presence of the world. And so hear this benediction as we leave today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us each and every day. Can I get a loud amen from everybody for that? Amen. 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 It's recorded. Amen. Uh, we're going to hear some other music here, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss you. <laughs>